Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome any everybody to this uh, online conversation with author Gemma Files, a class uh, that I'm teaching, English 1400, on the topic of monstrosity in literature. Um, and it's part, uh, sponsored both by the Department of English, Film, Television, and Media at the University of uh, Manitoba and by the Institute for the Humanities. Uh, Serenity, can I throw it over to you really quickly now? Thanks, Mary. My name is Serenity. I'm the director here at the UMIH, and I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone today. I'll start with the treaty acknowledgement that the University of Manitoba campuses and the UMIH physically are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples, and that we are also on the homeland of the Métis Nation. I hope that when we're uh, listening to Gemma Files today, that uh, this ongoing colonial history of theft and occupation will frame our pursuit of knowledge, um, including locating our individual positions within this local context. Um, today's guest lecture as well is from a class that Marie, Dr. Marie Leader is teaching, uh, English 1400 um, on monstrosity in literature. And Dr. Marie is a research affiliate with the UMIH this year. And uh, this programming is part of our, our pandemic programming, pivoted pandemic programming this year to highlight the kind of teaching that goes inside classrooms and take advantage of the, uh, the guest lectures that are coming through different classes so that we can showcase uh, what's going on inside our classrooms. Thanks, Marie. Okay, thank you very much, Serenity. Um, so I'll just introduce uh, our guest today. Formerly a film critic, journalist, and screenwriter and teacher, Gemma Files has been an award-winning horror writer since 1999. She has published four co uh, collections of uh, short work, three collections of speculative poetry, a weird Western trilogy, story cycle, and a standalone novel. And that's the one that we're talking about today, in fact, which I dutifully waved before my webcam. Experimental film, which won the uh, 2015 Shirley Jackson Award for Best Novel and the 2016 Sunburst Award for Best Adult Novel. She has a new story collection out from Grimm's Tribe Press, uh, In This Endlessness, Our End, and another upcoming. So uh, welcome, Gemma. Hi. Uh, now, uh, my students and I uh, put together some questions to put before you last week uh, when, when we met on uh, Wednesday, I guess it was. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, and I've sent those to you in advance, but if anybody has any questions that have come to them more recently, feel free to uh, contribute via chat or, or whatever uh, method. But I'll start out with, um, with the first one. I think the one that was sort of most pressing, I, I couldn't help but feel when we were uh, discussing these questions. And that's about actually what we we're just talking about, the autobiographical elements of the book. Um, considering that it seems extensively autobiographical in terms of characterization and situation, if not story. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was that process like? Like, why did you decide to uh, make it so autobiographical? And what was, what was the, were there consequences in terms of you writing, you know, your family members <laughs> and stuff like that? Um, okay, so uh, basically I got the idea for experimental film um, in a very conceptual kind of way. Uh, I knew that I wanted to write about a haunted film, uh, a piece of media that was <clears throat> sort of cursed and cursing, uh, something that was infectious, uh, that it, and the idea of that when you see something, it looks back at you. Um, and for about three years, I did a lot of research and I wrote about 30 pages and then I would slam against a wall and not be able to go any further. Um, and always when I showed people these sections, they would be like, I don't know, there's something about the something about the framing that's not really working here for me. <laughs> and, then, and then I remember at a certain point, um, I was sitting somewhere, probably in a coffee shop, and I went, oh, fuck, no, it's going to have to be me. I'm, I'm going to have to be the main character. I'm going to have to be the, the POV character. Um, and then everything fell into place immediately because... The thing that you want for any kind of protagonist is 
not just to find their voice, but also to present a person who's to some degree already in trouble. Um, I always, uh, I, I teach a class off and on on Lit Reactor um, called Write What You Fear. And one of the things that I talk about in terms of horror in general is that horror begins with a sense of wrongness. Something is wrong. And the great part about, <laughs> the great part about Lois Cairns' life is that everything is wrong. <laughs> and it's it's wrong from the from the very beginning in that um she is in a place where everything that she defined herself by up to this point has dropped away and that was autobiographical that did happen to me um you know i've given a lot of interviews where people have said well you know how did you make that transition from short fiction to writing novels. And I'm like, oh yeah, well, I remember um, around the time that my son was diagnosed <laughs> with autism spectrum disorder, um, I lost my job <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had already lost um, my job as a film reviewer. Uh, and so the two things that I defined myself by uh, suddenly disappeared overnight. And also I was in this place where I was like full of guilt and anger and pain and depression um, because I not only was having difficulty dealing with Cal, my son, the way he was, but also um, uh, it was difficult for me to see uh, a future uh, in which he would be able to be a full functioning human being, um, which thankfully he is. <laughs> But, you know, that took a while. Uh, and so for about a year, I was just depressed and writing because I always write, but mainly writing just fan fiction, 310 to Yuma fan fiction. <laughs> and, you know, at the end of that year, I looked around and went, oh, you wrote like 100,000 words of this shit. You could write a you could write a novel. In fact, you just did write a novel, just one that you can't actually sell to anybody. Um, and things began to change. So um, that is a moment of decision. That is a moment of change. Um, now, Lois is in a very different place simply because she isn't a fiction author. She defines herself as a teacher, as an externalist, as an ex-film critic. And, you know, and if I hadn't had fiction to quote, quote, fall back on, uh, at that point in my life, then I would have been in the same place of saying, what have I done in in my life except enable other people's dreams? What have I actually created? What have I actually found out? You know, so that too. Um, one of my favorite horror movies is Candyman. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that, that idea of like, I want to find that one thing. I want to, mm, I want to find out something nobody else knows and, and how that can carry you um, straight past those moments where the people who are watching the movie might go, you know, maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe, no, don't crawl through there. What? No, nah, oh, oh shit. You know, um, so all of those things conspired to make me recognize that I, as I had been at one point, was the perfect format for this character. And then Lois began to grow out of that. Um, okay, so what, what, uh, what, what splashback did I suffer? Um, pretty much none, you know, it's like Cal doesn't care. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I'm not even sure he knows what I do for a living to some degree. Um, but, uh, and my husband came off very well, I would think, um, because one of the first strategic decisions that I made was that I didn't want to tell a story about how someone's kid gets diagnosed as autistic and then immediately their marriage fails. I wasn't interested in, in telling that story. Um, which which has caused uh, at least some reviewers to go like, wow, he's like the nicest guy in the world. You have his balls in your pocket. And I'm like, oh, my God, what is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> but um, 
uh, probably the the person who responded least favorably was my mother. But on the other hand, she, you know, I said, you you know, that's not you, right? And she said, eh, it seems a little bit like me. And I'm like. <laughs> so I was wondering about that specifically about the mother um, mm -hmm. who doesn't come off that badly admittedly but you know um, uh, my, my mother and I have a slightly contentious kind of relationship mm -hmm. but on the other hand we were everything to each other for a long long time mm -hmm. uh, in my formative years so so the se second question we had was about from where you typically draw inspiration and was it different than usual for experimental film? Now, some of that has already been spoken to, but yeah. I suppose that question could be directed towards the non-autobiographical uh, non elements in the novel. Um, yeah. Or the purportedly, you know, I don't know, I assume that you've not had personal contact with any, you know, ancient European gods or, or any such. Not that I know of, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, so perhaps I can, I can ask about that, you know, when did Lady Midday land on your radar and uh, the, the framework about, about uh, early Canadian filmmaking? And I also ah. really want to know about Rob Barney, where he comes from, because <laughs> he really stood out more. And we had, we had read Dracula early this term, and there's something vaguely Renfield-like about him as well. Yeah, it's weird. He is like a Renfield without a Dracula, because Lady Midday um, is so beyond human consideration. You know, she would mm -hmm. not care if someone was working on her behalf. Yeah. Um, and, unless she set out to make that person work on her behalf. Um, yeah, well, so you know, Rob's... Dracula discards Renfield as soon as he's no longer useful. So there's a similar kind of dynamic there, I suppose. Mm, yeah, Renfield is the John the Baptist yeah. um, to to Dracula in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't hear about John much after that, except that he gets his head cut off. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Uh, OK, so. I have been interested in a bunch of different things. I'm an autodidact um, from way back uh, because, um, you know, let's face it, I, I uh, part of the journey with my son was recognizing that I probably am Asperger's, Aspergian. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not formally diagnosed, but that thing of, I looked at a bunch of symptoms and went, hmm, this sounds very, very familiar to me, <laughs> leads me to believe. And, and also the fact that uh, there are a lot of women who are undiagnosed, even to the age that I am now, um, who get diagnosed when their sons get diagnosed. <laughs> um, because women are taught to mask, women are taught to um, uh, to put on a face and be happy and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, you know, and people go, oh, you, you don't, you don't seem autistic. And I'm like, yeah, sit down and let me talk to you for a while. And you will just realize that I moved from hyperfixation to hyperfixation. Um, so a lot of my autodidactism comes out of that. And there are certain things that I've been interested in my entire life. And um, I was interested in movies and the history of movies uh, for a long time before I became a film critic. I was interested in witchcraft. I was interested in archeology. span I was interested in mythology, world mythology. Um, the idea of <clears throat> that little gods become monsters uh, when they don't have worshipers anymore. Um, this is something that I've been playing with for a long time. And um, Lady Midday in specific uh, came out of the fact that I wanted to locate this in a particular part of Ontario that I had uh, that I had made up for a, a couple of other um, a couple of other narratives, uh, specifically for uh, we will all go down together, the story cycle. Um, it's a place called uh, the Lake of the North District. <laughs> And um, one of the elements in Lake of the North District is that there are a um, 
there are a bunch of people from uh, from what used to be the Slavic part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and uh, so I was looking for a a monster from that area that I could retcon into being uh, a dead goddess or a, a goddess who had become a monster um, by being forgotten. And um, I was browsing around the internet the way that I often do. And, oh, look, here's a list of demons from Slavic countries and went, oh, Lady Medea. Yeah, that is interesting. The Polidnice, the, um, the person who appears to you and says, are you doing your work? And if you're not doing your work, uh, she cuts your head off. Um, I've always been interested in fairy tales. The idea of um, characters like Baba Yaga and um, uh, Mother Hola, these people who are not quite <laughs> predators and not quite teachers, but um, you you know you you can tangle with them, and if you're smart enough, you'll get away. Um, so all of that came together with Lady Midday. But another thing that I was interested with with her is how much she um, sort of reminded me of the idea of a muse, a creative muse. You know, I, I have a lot of friends who, I'm, I'm a big outliner <laughs> and I have a lot of friends who are kind of pantsers, you know, they, and uh, I have at least one friend who is always going, oh, I just get things, you know, and then I figure out how they go together my muse speaks to me. She speaks to me inside my brain. And I'm like, that sounds terrifying. That sounds really creepy. <laughs> you know? So, so the idea of like someone appearing to you and going, do your work, you know, and you having to go, what, what are you talking about? Oh, whoa, my brain is on fire. You know, um, I have migraine headaches. Uh, I've had moments where in the middle of a fever I felt like my brain was melting and all of this went into the making of my version of Lady Midday um, and uh, how Lady Midday would be the integral metaphor of 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 the book. Um, now in terms of my knowledge of Canadian film history I needed a mystery. I needed a, um, you know, if if I say my character has to be driven by curiosity, what is she curious about? Well, what would be the best thing that you could find as a person who teaches Canadian film history? It would be someone no one has ever heard about before. And that person will become your entree to a world where it's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Lois Cairns found out something that nobody else nobody else knew about. There she is. So it's it's like there's that parasitical relationship that uh, I think um, is at the heart of uh, the nonfiction process, where it's like, oh, that's a beautiful story. How do I tell that story? How do I? But really, you know, when you're when you're making a person into a book or a person into a film, uh, you're still doing all the clipping and squishing that you do um, writing a piece of straight up fiction. Um, so there's always that element of I I understand this person better than possibly they understood themselves. So yeah, to to look at someone like Mrs. Wickham and go like, oh my God, you know, it's like, why was she making films? You know, how was she making films? Um, what was it she was trying to do with these films? Um, but always from that parasitical angle of how can I tell this story? And then me telling her story will make me complete. You know, maybe not not famous or powerful. I mean, this is Canadian film we're talking about, right? But you know, it will make me complete because suddenly, somehow, finally, I will be the person that I was always meant to be. Um, does how's that? Does that? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it actually makes me think of like when I was in an honors seminar in my own English degree uh, back uh, back then in the past when I was an English major. And um, uh, I remember the professor saying something like, he thinks that it's everybody, every archival scholar's fantasy to discover an unknown artist who then you can be the sort of yes. sole arbiter of their cultural presence. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, you know, it's, 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 it's like people who are, you know, it's like, I, I am the translator of Yukio Mishima. You know, I am uh, the person who is uh, the, um, the archivist of, of Francis Bacon. You know, I, I think it helps if the person that you're, uh, you're taking up and trying to present to other people is not um, making the same kind of art that you are. <laughs> so, you know, and also, um, you know, I've, I've always had that weird kind of disconnect between, you know, I, I love film and I love visual art, but, and, you know, and I'm, it's like I painted whatever, you know, uh, I used to, I used to draw a lot, but I, I would hardly call myself an artist. Um, the visual is fascinating to me because it's not actually something that I share. Everything comes to me as words. So, yeah. So I don't know if you have the chat open, but a, a question has been passed on from the Facebook Live audience. Okay. Uh, All right. You see that there? Do you feel like writing fiction, like reading fiction rewired your brain? I love the idea that words can physically change our brains. You are very inspiring and resilient and cool. Cal is a lucky kid. Thank you. Um, yeah, he's Calum, not Calvin, but yeah. Um, yes, he is. Damn. <laughs> it's like, so lucky to be my kid. Um, yeah, I do actually feel like reading and writing rewired my brain. But um, my earliest memories have as much to do with... Um, uh, I. I learned how to read fairly early, um, but I demanded uh, my parents to continue to read to me um, when I was a kid for much longer than they wanted to um, because they knew I could read. Um, and some of my earliest memories have to do with listening to my parents read to me and then that moment where it snapped together in my brain uh, as I was looking at the book that they had been reading to me and instead of, you know, uh, oh, I recognize this because I've memorized large sections of this, it becomes, oh, I, I never saw this part before. I think maybe they skipped over this. This is interesting. Oh, shit, I guess I can read. Um, <laughs> uh, that moment, um, yeah, that was that was very big. And also my, my parents are actors, so um, they used to... They used to do possibly age inappropriate things like um, read Twelfth Night to me because one of them was working on it. Um, so, yeah, from a pretty early age, I was hearing a lot of different voices in my head and seeing a, a lot of different ways that words could be put together. Um, we all begin in pastiche as as writers. Um, and I was very lucky in that my supplies of templates for pastiche, I think were maybe wider than some other people's. Um, you know, everything from Son of Satan comic books and Spider-Man or whatever to, um, to Shakespeare and uh, various other types of um, poetry. Uh, so, I do feel like like both of those things rewired my brain, um, but then again, I feel that uh, watching watching films and watching and being taken to live theater also uh, rewired my brain. Um, a lot of my stuff tends to be very monologue-ish. It's internal. Um, there's a lot of uh, I, I do all the stuff that I used to tell people not to do in screenwriting class, which is good because you know that's what fiction is for. You know, in screenwriting class, I had to say, well, let's face it. There's just what you see, what people do, and what you hear them say. 
uh, their thinking, but you don't get to hear it most of the time. You know, whereas with fiction, you can be right there in the socket and hear everything and see everything and be experiencing it from the inside as well as the outside at the same time. So one question that we uh, we had that a lot of students seemed interested in uh, when we put this together before is how do you feel about the possibility of this novel being adapted to a multimedia format or to a different format like like film or a television series and um, <laughs> like um, I guess that's that's a pretty loaded question I guess but uh, you want to run um, that one for a minute? No, I. I, I... I, I don't think it's necessarily loaded. Um, it's uh, it would be different, and it would have to be different um, because of the things that I just talked about. Um, I would be fascinated to see how someone would go about doing that, and I cannot tell you that I haven't had negotiations with people um, over like the years since this novel has been released into the world. Um, and every time somebody is like, ah, oh, well, here's how I might go at it. I'm really interested. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, because of the, because of the way that production works, uh, I have to kind of hold myself back and go like, unless you ask me for my opinion, I'm not gonna, I, I, sh I probably should not offer it as to how it could be repackaged for a purely visual medium. Um, my mom is of the opinion that it would work best as a mini series, but a limited mini series. So like a British type of mini series where it's less um, 23 episodes than six episodes, you know. Um, my, uh, and yet I've spoken to some people who've given me pretty good pitches as to how it could be squished down into a two hour movie. Um, most of that has to do with perspective. Most of that, you know, it has to do with how you would actually shoot it. Um, my vote is for found footage and it wouldn't be found footage so much as a, um, as, as it would be uh, Safi's potential uh, documentary, like the footage for that potential documentary which would then be put together after the fact. So it'd be a little more like Lake Mungo than say the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> um, but always with that guiding thing of, you know, and here's where things started to change. And suddenly the subject of the movie was not so much um, Mrs. Whitcomb and the search for Mrs. Whitcomb. It was, oh shit, what's happening to Lois? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff um, that you can do with it. Uh, yeah, my uh, my feeling is very much like uh, Stephen King slash James Elroy's feeling, which, you know, is, oh, I hate what they did with all your books, Mr. King. W what did they do with my books? They're, they're all up there on the shelf. And of course, James Elroy, you know, yeah, people complain to me about, you know, oh, they took my book and they made it into this movie. And I'm like, well, you took the fucking money, didn't you, cocksucker? <laughs> That's it. So there's more in the chat now, but uh, just, I think, following okay. up on your comment to that earlier question. Let me too. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, thankfully, uh, yeah, Cal's, um, yeah, I, I hope that we're good parents and I hope that we're cool parents. Uh, my, my husband and I, um, I mean, we are who we are. Uh, and again, I think it's interesting to, um, you know, much, much like, you know, much like Lois, uh, my, my journey from the beginning was, you know, like over the last the first three years uh, after Cal's diagnosis, I got a lot of people going, well, what do you think happened? <laughs> I'm like, hmm, I'm thinking two people who are probably on the spectrum uh, and did not get diagnosed, uh, got together and had a kid who's super on the spectrum. I think that that's what happened. 
um, I, I think that idea of um, people marrying for affinity uh, as opposed to other considerations means that a lot of geeky people got together and made super geeky kids. Um, that nothing else makes sense to me. Uh, and um, so I think it is good possibly to have two spectrum -y parents if you are uh, a kid with a diagnosis. Um, but then again, you know, it's like we had to go through the same push pull, the same social thing that everybody else had to, that everybody else goes through. Um, it, neurotypical parents go through when their kid gets a diagnosis, it, which all has to do with, but how is your life going to be from now on? How is the child's life going to be? You know, um, looking back on it, I wish I had a diagnosis because then at least <laughs> I remember the first person I met uh, who had Asperger's. Um, came to a dinner with friends of mine and you know uh she sat down next to us and she was like okay so if i say something inappropriate uh be aware that i have i have a diagnosis of asperger's syndrome and i turned to the man who had become my husband and said wow i wish i'd had that that would have been good you know as opposed to uh thinking growing up thinking i had asshole syndrome i everybody eventually starts to think that i'm an asshole because i say something super inappropriate <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that whatever cool factor we have, it comes out of that. Um, the biggest thing with Cal was that eventually he found the hyperfixation, which hopefully will carry him through life. Um, the vocation, which hopefully will carry him through life. Um, the way that storytelling became my vocation, music is his vocation. It's his language, you know, so all the echolalia and all the singing and all the, you know, it's like, it can be channeled through that. And, you know, when I say music is his language, he taught himself how to play the piano. He has perfect pitch. He, um, you know, it was, so, so all that stuff that seemed so annoying and weird, you know, actually was him consolidating in his brain the way that he was going to see things for the rest of his life. And that's, that's super cool. And I'm really glad that we were aware enough to see it and to not just go, oh, it's a stem, discard it, try to be normal. Because what the fuck is normal? Normal is a, oh, I'm sorry. I was about to quote Harley Quinn. Normal really is like a setting on a dishwasher. I wonder if you can talk a bit about your writing process. Like, like when do you write? How much do you write at a stretch? How uh, do, do you have a routine or is it, is it looser than that? Can you, I, I, I saw a talk with uh, Michael Chabon a few years ago and for all the great stories that he had, the most interesting thought, the stuff that I thought was what he just talked about the craft of, of writing. Like, here are the hours in which I write and things like that. I, I yeah. like to hear writers talk about that sort of thing. Okay. Um, well, uh, you know, I'm coming at it from the point of view that uh, I am a stay at home mother uh, who also writes. And, um, you know, and again, that took a while to settle into. Um, I, I haven't had uh, a job that takes me outside of the home since I lost my job teaching. <laughs> um, and uh, so whatever time I spend writing, I have to carve out for myself. And um, so what I tend to do is I carry a notebook around and I make um, copious notes on every fucking thing. And uh, then at a certain point, I carve out increments of time where I can sit and um, transfer those notes uh, to my computer. Um, and then I start moving things around. And often what I find is that you'll get bits of text, bits of prose, um, more 
for me, it's always voice. It's always somebody talking, you know, somebody talking about how they see the world, somebody talking about some weird thing that happened to them, some observation. And then when you start to play with that stuff, um, you suddenly go, oh, there's a pattern here. Uh, oh, I think this is a I think this is a whole story. Um, and, you know, sometimes I get an idea right from the beginning where it's like, what if that happened? And then that, and then that. But more likely, um, particularly with short things, I tend to get a beginning and an end. And then I have to figure out not so much how you get from here to there, but why you get from here to there. Because it's always about why people make the choices they, they do and why things develop the way that they do. Um, and most of that has to do with what kind of person you are uh, and what kind of situation you're put in. Um, this sounds very airy-fairy, um, but the, uh, the most important thing to remember is don't ever throw anything away um, because you can fix bad writing, but you can't fix no writing. Um, and everything is useful. You think that it's not when you just, <laughs> I, I remember one time I was going through uh, uh, one of my notebooks and I found, uh, <laughs> and I, I found a line which was just, what is shape? What is gender? And I was just like, what the fuck is this? I was like, why did I write this down? I have no idea. Later I realized that I, I had probably been thinking about David Cronenberg. Um, and yeah, and oh yeah, it was, it, would be, it was because on the next page I, I had written Cronenberg equals chimerism. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. So uh, I, I guess I was writing some kind of essay about David Cronenberg, put that somewhere. So yeah. You know, you uh, you transfer the notes, you break them out into separate files, you move them around, and then you start to build connective tissue between them. And then once you've got a rhythm established, um, yeah, it becomes, it, it sort of starts to chug. Um, I like having deadlines. I hate it too, but I like having deadlines because then at least I can say, oh, okay, so I've got like two weeks to get <laughs> this fucking thing into, <laughs> into some kind of shape where I can actually show it to somebody. Um, people have asked me, how many times do you draft something? Um, I hate to say it, but usually what you see as an editor is my first draft. Um, I write till it's done. And then, and then I cut it afterwards. I overwrite, um, and then I cut it down. Uh, Sandra Castori, uh, who was the editor on um, experimental film, said, uh, "Well, she wasn't the editor, but she was. Uh, yeah, she was. She was the editor at Cheesing. Um, overall, uh, said the thing with you, Gemma, is that you'll write the same sentence." in slightly different variations, like three times in a row. I said, well, yeah, I have to write the same sentence three times in a row to get the right sentence. And then you, t you, you take two of those sentences and you squish them into one. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, I'm, I'm fine with editing my own stuff and I'm fine with cutting my own stuff. Uh, I cut like at least 25,000 words out of everything that I've ever written that's novel length. So, you know, it's like if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it goes. And I'm not, I'm not vain about that. I think probably that had to do with being trained as a journalist. Um, but the older I get, the more draining it becomes to work deadline to deadline. Um, so I guess I'll have to deal with that at some point. <laughs> but at the moment, this is, this, is, this is the way I work, deadline to deadline. Um, like a bunch of sprints, there's a big, there's chugging, there's a, there's a general kind of marathon going on, and then there's a bunch of sprints.
And those are self-imposed okay. deadlines? Right. Those are deadlines? Uh, no, you... those are dead. Yeah, deadlines from, from the outside. I've been very lucky I over, I'd say, the last 10 years um, that most deadlines are imposed uh, from the outside, although not, not novel deadlines. Um, mm. I think a lot of people, you know, it's like I really, really admire people who can just get an idea for a novel and write it. And, you know, I have to ruminate a little bit more than that. I have to chew it for a long time. And for a lot of uh, for a lot of that, it is me going like, "Here's the hole. Here's the peg. Why don't they fit together? God, what the fuck me? You know, it's like, how do I make this peg fit into this hole? Um, and it takes a long time for me. But I know people, Jesus, like Paul Trom Tremblay, who seems to be able to, you know, it's like I got an idea and then I wrote it. Uh, or, you know, Joyce Carol Oates, who seems to shit books. <laughs> so it's like, mm, I went to the bathroom and I pulled another book out of my bum. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. And it was beautiful and perfect. <laughs> it's like, what am I doing wrong? Um, but I think all writers feel like that. All writers feel like they're not working to capacity. I think that's probably a truism, yeah. Hmm. So we're nearing the end of our time. I don't know if anybody else has any questions they'd like to chime in from uh, the student body here. Um, other than the ones that we hashed uh, together before. Uh, perhaps I'll just right. ask a pretty generic one and that's what are you working on now? <laughs> um, I'm working, uh, I'm working on uh, five short stories that need to be done sometime in the next, I'd say two to three months, um, and three novels, uh, one of which is a novel that much like experimental film, I've been turning around and turning around and turning around in my head. Um, and much like experimental film, it's a, it's a standalone horror novel that's very much based on my life. Um, and I was, uh, I was very lucky to, um, be asked at the last moment by Ellen Datlow to contribute something to a Shirley Jackson tribute anthology, which allowed me to take part of that novel and hammer it into a short story. Um, and I, I think that this particular novel is going to be a little more Caitlin R. Kernan in that, um, I, I don't know if you guys have read The Red Tree, you should totally read it if you haven't, um, or The Drowning Girl. Um, in both of those, uh, the main characters are writers uh, and throughout the novels, there are stories that they're writing about the things that are happening to them and the things that are happening inside of them. Um, and what I hope is that this short story will allow me um, to juxtapose the way that, the way that as, a writer, as a writer, things from your life and you use them. But what is the thing, what is the difference between the fiction and the fact? Uh, sorry, the, your audio yeah. went, I don't know if it was just me, it went very weird for a second. I could per perhaps oh. blame Lady Midday, I don't know. Um, yeah, but maybe. It, it, it's back now. <laughs> it's, it's normal now. Okay, good. Um, but uh, um, where, where did it where did it go off? Uh, only for about 10 seconds, just towards the end of when you were talking. Okay. Um, All right. So yeah, what is what is the diff what is the difference between the fiction and the fact? Mm -hmm. What is, the, you know, the fact that you hammer into fiction? Um, and yeah, that that one is very much going to be about the difference between what you make out of your life and what actually happened in your life. Well, that sounds good. I look forward to that. Does it have a title as yet that you can I share? I look forward to it. Too. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's called Night Crawling. <laughs> uh, oh, I see. It, okay. It's called Night Crawling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm going to be um, writing it probably for Trepidatio um, since Cheezine has collapsed. Yes, yes, so. I heard about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's that's an interview in itself. I'm sure I'm sure it probably is. Yeah, 
Um, all right. Well, I, I think that maybe is all that we need to, uh, to take of your time for today, Gemma, but I, I'm sure we all thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, silently clap like so. <laughs> thank you very much. This was really wonderful. I, I always like to talk, especially about myself. This is an opportunity to do that, I suppose, but you've uh, you've shared a lot of interesting stuff for us to think about. I, I don't know if you